good um a good way to kick off i think is probably a little bit of introduction so um doc obviously you're you've worked in the industry for a, a very long time um have uh vast expertise in in print management so i think if you wanted to just give a little introduction on yourself a bit about your background um would be a great way to start Thanks, Roman. Uh, been in the industry for quite some time. I mentioned some things in the accompanying blog that I was involved with printing. Well, even when printing first started with copiers. So uh, I've been a system engineer, subject matter expert, solution architect. They all kind of revolve around the same thing, sales engineer, uh, in terms of supporting the copier. Now, a, a copier has really changed over the years. And that's kind of why we're having this discussion. As a matter of fact, print has always been one of the last things that, that people think about. Uh, there aren't really any, there's only one college actually that I know of that has a print type of program that's available. Uh, so you don't find it in colleges. It's things that, uh, that people kind of uh, just, you know, kind of work on on their own. There aren't any certificates from Microsoft or anything. So printing has been a, a unique animal. And I've been a part of that for 20 plus years. Uh, that's on the professional side. On the personal side, you can see a bunch of music stuff behind me. So that's my other passion is, is music. Fantastic. Awesome. Yeah, no. Um, so I think that, that really highlights that you know what you're talking about, really. <laughs> um, it's really great. And I think as well, it's, it's good to pause. We've, we're not going to go too technical on this conversation. It's not going to be uh, a, a, a very under the hood look. It is high level. Um, we want to kind of keep this friendly to someone who is new to, to low balancing, high availability. And yeah, hopefully it's a, a nice, easy conversation to follow. So, I mean, we've been talking about areas that you might not think the print management application is responsible for. Um, and I heard some interesting examples in, in healthcare with um, printing wristbands. I don't know if you could just speak a little to that and uh, in, in kind of some areas to highlight that, that you, you may overlook what, what actually these, these are responsible for. Sure. The... Printer, printers or, or copiers, is, you know, whatever you want to call them, MFPs, MFDs, they have all sorts of different labels, yeah. are not just a copier today. As a matter of fact, copying is probably the last thing that, that most of them do. When you look at a, a traditional multifunctional device, it can print, it can copy, it can scan. And kind of in the order today, it is print, scan, and copy. I should have uh, should have stated it that way. But that's kind of the order in which many copiers are being used today, uh, mostly as a larger printer, as a high-speed printer, for instance. It might have finishing capabilities for uh, hole punching and stapling, things like that. Then people use copiers for scanning. And finally, you know, you'll get that occasional copy use that's available too. So what that means is that this device becomes the center in the organization. It's, it's the element that moves documents around the entire organization electronically. That can be really important when you have just a piece of paper. And this piece of paper, you know, you can only do so much with a physical piece of paper, but here I want to digitize this document, send it into the organization's network, maybe a document management system, something along that line. Maybe I need to capture, that's another term used with imaging, capture information off of a document, reuse it for another purpose, uh, uh, for data that gets extracted for somewhere else, or we just need to archive it or store it, maybe move it into a cloud storage so that I can have access on my mobile device. So the copier becomes a very centralized piece of equipment, and I shouldn't even call it a copier anymore, because again, that's about the last thing we do with it is copy. So we don't think about that. It's important to make sure that this device is in many organizations, at least, is taken care of, and it's able to be used so that you can do what's necessary to keep your business going without any downtime. That's, that's the secret. When you start to look at a uh, an enterprise level deployment for large organizations that really rely on that automation. Um, you can see how important it is that 
that is able to happen. These entire departments are communicating so well with each other because the application is, is, is allowing them to. It's, it's that platform to say information at point A can only get to point, point B because in the middle, this application is doing all of the work, notifying all of the people and, and, and doing all the right things to get there. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it can be very overlooked um, as to just how important these applications are. Because again, you, you'd, you'd kind of, you would use that umbrella term because you can't go and reel off all of those words to explain what it is. So you would just say, oh, your print environment. But what we're talking about here is this massive chunk of, of your organization's document workflow world. And then suddenly it becomes very important to think, oh, actually, we are very heavily reliant on that. You said print, and I thought, how many times do I hit print? And it's maybe not as often as how many times I go and scan something. And then that goes off into the ecosystem that enables however many other people to do their job and then the end result for, for, for whatever that document's purpose is. Part of the realization that a lot of people don't have is the fact that in order to accomplish this with a multifunctional device, multifunctional printer, whatever, is it has to be on the network. And so now all of these devices have computers in them, little brains, and they're designed in all sorts of different ways. And, and they're set up with every protocol that's uh, available for us. And many times everything's turned on automatically. So sometimes, you know, you just take this this copier and put it on the network and it's just like wide open and, and people can do anything. And that's really important when we talk about scanning as well. Yes, this is a hub. Yes, you can digitize documents, but you don't necessarily want a brand new employee, for instance, to have access to scanning because they could take your sensitive data and just scan it and have it go anywhere and it might be outside of the company. So you want to have controls. And a lot of times folks don't think about that when, you know, again, we're just thinking about print. Well, just put the printer on there. Well, you got to take a little caution on it. I, I always talk about hardening the printers, a little technical term. Hardening just means turning off protocols and things that you don't use. Uh, you know, if you're not going to do mobile printing, for instance, you turn off some of the protocols that are available, like Bonjour and MDNS, and uh, you know, we don't have to get into all the, the details on all that, but turning off some things that just aren't needed. So they're not there for somebody to attack your system. And, you know, we hear of all these cyber attacks and ransomware and all that, and it could start from just any kind of device that's open, that's available, and it can cause a lot of problems if we're not paying attention to what's going on. And then the other part of that is it, when we are printing with it, there's a lot of industries that have to print. They're just so reliant on printing. We mentioned hospitals. I mean, imagine if you were at the hospital, and I heard of this happening, being at the hospital, the system has gone down, they weren't able to print the wristbands for people coming in, and they weren't able to print discharge papers for those that were going out. And this was just a few months ago, in the middle of the pandemic, when hospitals were, you know, just packed full of people, unfortunately, you know, we're getting a little better now, which is good. But you know, that caused a lot of delays. And frankly, they didn't have room for delays. And there were other issues that that happened because of the printing system. So it's something that, you know, you don't think about it until you don't have it. And then you've got, you know, universities, universities are very print reliant, you've got especially in uh, very much higher education when they're trying to, to print out uh, uh, maybe their master's thesis or something along that line, and they've got a deadline to get it to the, the professor. If the print system goes down, they can't do it, they, they might miss a grade, they might miss a degree, it might cost them a year of extra education, some things like that if they can't print because the system has gone down. Yeah. Um, legal, as you mentioned, Another yeah. big one there too. They have deadlines for courts and a lot of legal still is reliant on paper. Some are starting to take PDFs and some electronic documents, but most are still very reliant on paper. So you need to be able to produce that paper when you need it and, and to be able to take it to court or send it to the opposing counsel or whatever the case may be when you're in a legal type of environment. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think I think uh, so. That's that's uh, a really good way of highlighting one of the conversations, that, and, and like we just had, is everything around what it brings to the table. But then in, in, in a shift to say, well, the conversation is always around these bring this. You can now do this additional to what you used to be able to do. This is all it brings. But what happens when it doesn't, when, when it stops working? And, and, and like you said, I mean, with the, with the hospital and not being able to print discharge papers, and, and I mean, what, what does that actually look like on the ground and, and, and someone trying to, to, to leave, get their discharge papers or, or someone coming in printing, I mean, what, what the, the tan, like I say tangible, but the, uh, the real world effects of that is people can't be checked in, checked out in the middle of a pandemic and in, in the university case, um, uh, I mean, you said dissertations being printed, Courseworks, things like that. Mortgage companies. There's another one. You know, they've got to print out uh, all the applications and things. Have uh, the people sign? You know, the documents. It's all very paper related. So they still even rely on fax technology. They don't even trust email in a lot of cases. So you know, they're they're still using fax. Uh, so if something goes down there, you could you could find yourself in a case where. You know, you've offered a, a, a deal to a customer and the points expire at midnight, but now you can't print the application and they can't sign off on it. You don't get the points. And, you know, well, somebody's going to suffer that. And the mortgage company is probably going to have to cover that loss, you know, for uh, the end user because they've, they've made that promise to the customer. I mean, you can't say, oh, well, you know, we made an error. So now it's going to cost you another hundred thousand dollars. You know, um, the buyer is not going to put up with that, you know. Not at all, not at all. And I, I think as well, just looking at, how many people are, are, are going to be affected? I mean, so, sometimes you could say, "All right, well, the to, to, to a person, the effect is okay." Let's say in the university example, um, a student can't print their dissertation; it's down for an hour. Okay, it's an hour later, but on a large campus, how many students are in that queue? How many are sat there waiting? I mean, if it's if it's one waiting an hour, you could probably work around that. But if you're talking a couple of hundred, maybe some things there is a specific event that a lot of people need access at the sort of same kind of time there's, there's you're, you're multiplying that small issue by a great number and then actually what's the what's funny I mean, if, you, if you've got a uh 30 40 50 100 or so very annoyed students because this this one thing that they've been building up to now is is is, is stuck and they can't they can't that work and then well when the system comes up then you've got those 30 or 40 then that have to print and now all of a sudden your load goes very high on the printing system too uh as it's being you know used by so many people trying to print the documents and so you've got that that side of the things too now your your all your equipment is starting to to be in a very heavy load type of situation um you know you could be running out of paper because it's it's being used more often than a normal type of situation and no Nobody's paying attention and nobody wants to fill paper on an empty copy or two. That's the funniest thing. You know, it, it runs out of paper and it's like, who's responsible for that? And, and nobody really knows. You know? <laughs> That's one of those things. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, so we talk a lot about um in in the low balancing space in particular we do talk a lot about downtime because naturally that's what we're trying to avoid. We, we want to steer away from that. Um, we, we say that these systems are going to fail. This is the problem, but, what can actually cause this the horror story of the person going in to clean the data center that you know needs to plug for the vacuum they go oh i'll just unplug this and i'll plug the vacuum in and you know some of those are true stories too and they've taken down the entire network but there's so many pieces that's a lot of the physical stuff it, it could be a cable you know, which we call a, a layer one issue. We do talk about layers when we get into load balancing. So that's a layer one issue. And I've seen that happened. I had a printer one time in a showroom that took like a half hour to print jobs. I'm like, what the heck is going on? Why, why is this taking so long? And found out that there was a, like a 10 year old switch that happened to be installed behind that copier. And it was just slowing things down. And, and it was, I'm sorry, it was a hub. It wasn't even a switch, um, which te technologically is even worse to have than a switch. So, you know, those things can happen, but now let's look at the application. An application has an update. 
I'm sure you've never had an issue with like a Windows update causing a blue screen. (laughs) I mean, it happens to all of us. It, it, you know, Microsoft can push out something, but even Apple has had some things too, where they've had emergency patches, you know, coming out immediately. Um, iOS devices, Android devices, anything can come out with, you know, a new update that, oh, that didn't work. And now your application doesn't work and you're not able to do things. So that can take down a printing system too. A little bit different for a load balancer, but otherwise you've got all the, you know, the hard drive, the processors, the motherboards, and maybe you've got virtual systems. You can flip up another virtual system and, and get that going that, you know, that might work out for you. But there's one other thing in printing that happens quite frequently and, and might be one of the, the main causes for uh, printing to stop. And that's a corrupt driver. Mm-hmm. And drivers get corrupt from bad jobs. You know, a job has got something wrong in it and, and it gets into the system and it, it takes down that, that queue. Well, that stops that queue from working. That blocks other people from being able to print. Um, nice thing is, as we get more into load balancing is a load balancer could identify that and say, well, I'll just send it over to this one instead. And, and all is good. And we'll just go ahead and print that. I guess where I'm really going with this is if you're thinking in the back of your head that you might need some protection for your systems, then you, you probably do, (laughs) or at least you definitely want to have the conversation. Now, this is not something that every organization is going to want to do because there's going to be a cost. You know, when you start looking at uh, needing to have two servers instead of one, and then having something like a network load balancer to adjust, you know, where those things are going. So you are adding components. So you have to look at, you know, does it make sense for us to be able to do this? How long of a time is it going to take us to recover? And how much are we going to lose? How much data are we going to lose? Very important when you talk about like enterprise customers that ha- that still have mainframe printing. I know companies that are still using like AS 400s, uh, it, you know, so they're, they're doing a lot of printing overnight and they're printing out every report that's out there. So you don't want the system to go down in the middle of the night and, and not have all your reports in the, in the morning when you get to the office and that type of thing. So those are so many variables that can cause problems and so many things that you want to think about as to, you know, do we need to protect the print system or load balancing? When you look at what it does, people are like, well, what, what does load balancing actually do? And I'll kind of refer to a high availability document. That's a, that's actually a paper cut document is written by David O'Hara. And it's a really nice article on high availability and kind of discussing, you know, how to, you know, when you want to apply it, when you need to apply it, especially in printing, and then what is a load balancer? So if we think about a load balancer in a web application, let's use something that, that most of us use, Google. So I want to look up for something on Google and I type in, you know, www.google.com and I go to the site. You, Roman, need to do the same thing. You type in google.com. But I'm on google.com. You can't get to it because I'm on it if you didn't have a load balancer. So you might have to try to type in, you know, google2.com and see if that one works or google50 or 99 or so and still until one is open. So that's the beauty of load balancers and we're using this web application in that all I need to do is send it to google.com and then the load balancer will take a look at it and say, well, number 42 is open. So let's send it over to there. And Roman will be able to continue with his search or, you know, whatever it is he's trying to find a download of something or, you know, some software, et cetera, et cetera. You can't do that with a printer. You know, it needs to have that one IP. So this is where load balancing comes into play in a network where I send it to just one server. My print job goes to one server and that server then has a load balancer in front of it that looks at the entire system, looks at all the different servers and says, this one over here is available. I'm going to send it over to there. So like I say, there is some cost involved because you're going to replicate servers. You're going to have a network load balancer. So is it the right thing for you? It may be depending on, you know, how much 
can you afford to lose? How much time can you afford to be down? And those are the considerations that you want to think about in order to start creating a high availability system using a load balancer. I hope that makes sense. Like what you said, you've got to understand, you need to have that thought about, I mean, to, sorry, to have that thought about is high availability something I need to consider? You, you first need to make sure you're consciously thinking about, well, what am I making highly available? What, I mean, I'm looking at my, does my print environment need a load balancer? You first, first, you've got to understand what is my print environment responsible for? Oh, actually it's more than print, it's, it's everything. And it's, it's, it's that, I mean, that was one of the things I really wanted to get out today was to highlight, to get to people to think, what am I actually leaning on this for? How much do I fully understand the importance and the, the weight at which this, this, this environment is carrying? So I think that's the first thing to kind of think about. Like you said, the load balancer does, I guess, has two key roles. One is load distribution, and another one is um, failover, redundancy, mm -hmm. um, high availability. Mm -hmm. To call out to this diagram, which we have two application servers. Um, these could be, in this case, print uh, print servers or or, or paper application servers or, or web servers or, 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 or whatever we're talking, we're looking at two, two application servers here. The load balancers between the users and those servers, this is where the load balancer sits. And what it does is it takes the incoming traffic and distributes it to these backend servers, which are hosting these print management applications. And it's doing what's called a health check. Now a health check is basically the load balancer saying, if you're meeting this criteria, you are healthy and available to take requests. You can take this traffic. If you're a print server, I know that I can send a print job to you and it's gonna work. But if there's a failure, if anything happens to that server, as we mentioned before, is it natural disasters? Is it um, uh, tripping over cables? Is it um, upgrades um, not, not, not going right? Um, data center fires in early March, there was a data center fire in France that took out a big section of the .fr domains. I mean, in a place like that, you think to yourself is, is pretty secure, but it does happen. Um, it will fail over. So if there's a failure of that first server, the load balancer spots this, will fail over and send traffic to the next available healthy server. And that's what it's doing. It's, it's that, it's that, man in the middle appliance that is basically saying, I will make sure anything that you give me will make it to its destination and, and, and the job can be performed. Um, the application can function. Um, whereas without it, um, you would simply go to a server that's just not there. It's not healthy, it's not working. It's, it's failed for whatever reason that may be. And, and that's the role that load balancing plays into it. So you're avoiding that, I guess, ability to find out what would happen if uh, a number of uh, outpatients can't be discharged because the discharge papers can't be released. People can't be checked in because the wristbands can't be printed. You're avoiding against that. Your, your, your printing is done when you need it. Your security levels are there because the application can perform that monitoring um, job. Uh, and and the, the, as we said about the document workflow, the relevant people are going to receive the relevant jobs because the application is running. And if there is a failure to, to the people using these systems, it's, it's business as usual. They don't notice it. The, the person who right. has to part of the system gets a, a, a much friendlier notification that server one that was hosting your application has got a problem with it. Server two has taken over the load for now, but with, with, with much less stress than the alternative, go and fix that. And then we can bring that back into, bring that back into production and it's business running as usual. It's nice because as you say, it can route to the working server and, you know, maybe you've got a real problem, a, a major issue with, you know, the motherboard's fried or something on this, this first server. It now, it gives you time gives you time to fix that one while the the other server is taking care of of all the different loads that are being placed upon it 
Um, so it's important to to look at that, to be able to have that happen and to have it seamless to the end user. The end user doesn't have to do anything. They might, you know, there might be a, a couple extra seconds of a delay. And they're like, oh, well, that's kind of weird, but that's because we've just switched over to a different server. The processes are still going and, and they're still able to uh, retrieve their job, which reminds me, secure print where you send a print job and it's held until you release it very popular with hospitals because it satisfies a lot of government requirements uh, in the united states for instance it's hipaa where you just don't want a, a piece of paper with personal identification and, and health information just laying on a copier for anyone to pick up so you can still use secure print or what's called find me printing, uh, where you can send it to a, a roaming print service. So it just gets sent into the system and you walk up to any device, authenticate, and then retrieve your job. Now, I just said the word authenticate. Now, if these servers aren't talking, well, I probably can't authenticate which means the copier doesn't know me, which means I can't get my print job, which probably means I can't scan as well, which is the other important thing that the copier does. So, you know, when we say you can't print, again, we're using that print all encompassing word, <laughs> but it also means you can't scan. Yeah. Now you could probably make a copy, but you know, not everybody's making copies anymore. That's yeah. not the, the main thing that we need to do, but you can't print and scan. And scanning is, is very crucial in a lot of organizations today. Um, just a lot of people want to just, you know, scan it so it gets stored in their Google Drive, for instance, or their OneDrive or Dropbox, or, you know, a lot of the cloud uh, solutions that are out there so that they can have it on their mobile device. And when they're out and about, they can, they can go ahead and, and retrieve it. Mobile devices. That's a whole other area of printing. When I got involved in printing, of course, we weren't printing from phones and things. We were, we were just doing it from printers. It was kind of easy to get set up. Uh, but then all these things started to happen. Oh, I want to print from an Android. I want to print from uh, an iOS device. I want to print from, what's this thing? Chromebook? Huh? What's that? You know, so now we got to find out ways of doing it. And Chromebooks are used in a lot of schools today, too. So we want to keep these things up and running so that the students can complete their work, the teachers can get it. And, and it may not be appropriate for, you know, a K to 12 school. Uh, a lot of IT resources are really stretched thin in, in that uh, area as well. But definitely in universities and things that have full-blown networks. They've got servers running because they're running applications. They're doing all sorts of um, uh, other things for keeping track of, of uh, student records. And, you know, oh my gosh, you know, universities are uh, very complex networks that are doing tons of tons of things and are very, and I'll just use the word print centric, but printing being either printing documents or being able to scan documents for uh, reasons. A lot of times you're scanning things to their professors and things today too. So that's why it's critical to look at your organization and determine whether or not, you know, this is, this is something you've had a problem with. And it's, it's easy, you know, did, did something happen? And that's usually where we get the call. Uh, did something happen to where, now I need to start thinking about load balancing. Did I have a fire in the data center, like you know, like you're talking about? Um, another kind of example that was in this high availability article was uh, uh, there was a Linux setup, and the and the guy had it all set up. It was bulletproof. I mean, with with fire suppression and you know uh, uh, secondary servers and load balancing, and you know there wasn't anything that could happen, you know, to this particular network. Well, he was the only one that knew about it and he left the company. All right. So there's another problem that could happen. Uh, yeah. You know, it's a security practice is, is called separation of duties. And it's a good thing to have a couple of people that know, but in this case, you know, this person knew everything about the network. It was bulletproof. It was, you know, couldn't do anything to it. And he left the company. So now, you know, they're in a bad state as well. So, because nobody knew how to do it, they had to redo the whole system. 
So, you know, if you're using a little more uh, uh, regular types of systems and you have separation of duties, you've got an IT department and they're looking at setting up things in a quote unquote normal fashion. Um, that's where you look at putting load balancers in there to distribute yeah. that effectively and, you know, making things work without somebody going, oh my gosh, what did you do to make this thing work? You know? Absolutely. And actually that's, that's, that's actually quite interesting. You said that as well, because that, because I know we were saying earlier that, that you may not um look at low balancing exclusively for your print environment only now i think you would have definitely other areas but and and this this um is something that we've been speaking about recently the company is is actually having dedicated load balancing for for specific areas um and it does fall into that same um remit of, of not putting all of your eggs in one basket um load balancing for example um I mean, a, a load balancer is still a server um, mm -hmm. and, and prone to um, certain failures, which, which is one of the reasons why we always deploy in, in what we call an, an HA pair, a high availability pair, because if you, mm -hmm. don't, if you don't do that, all you've done is you've taken your single point of failure from the application server and moved it to the load balancer. Right. Deploy one, and it it makes no sense. And and um, I've I've seen it myself. Um, people that we're only going to deploy one of them, and and actually the conversation he says, well, just save yourself the time and don't buy a load balancer. You're only moving the single point of failure. So load balancer is deployed in an HA pair. And now what that second appliance is doing is just like the the first appliance is monitoring the. The, the application servers to make sure they're healthy to receive connections. The second application, sorry, the second load balancer is doing the same on the first load balancer and saying, well, well, if anything happens to this load balancer, I'm going to take over and make sure. So there's there's a lot of levels of, of redundancy there to really ensure that you've got business as usual. And to take it to take it back to what we were saying about having dedicated um, load balancing for different sectors. You're probably not going to just do printing. Uh, you're going to have other things behind that, especially well, like the database for the print management system. That's got to be protected. Uh, the application server needs to be protected as well. So, you know, there's a lot of lot of different pieces that that can get into the system, and that's why it's not for everybody. Yeah. But some people have to go, you know, so crazy with it that they look at, okay, my data center is in uh, Florida. Again, I'm in the state, so I'll, I'll use that. Uh, our data centers in the Florida, well, we're subject to hurricanes. Yeah. And, you know, what would happen if a hurricane took out our entire data center? So they have an entire data center replicated in Chicago, you know, in the, the middle of the country, so that if something happens, they can flip a switch. But it depends on what you need. That's going to be you know, like a government type of, of installation or, or uh, just a huge enterprise uh, uh, type of environment, you know, uh, large, uh, uh, like Boeing or, you know, somebody like that making plane, you know, those are the people that need to do, you know, really crazy things like that, but they need that. You know, there is a difference between 99% uptime and 99.999% uptime. There really is. You know, you think it's only 0.999, but if you really look at it, that 0.999 could be a couple hours of downtime that could destroy a complete project of some kind because they're not able to do the functionality that they need to. And it could be as simple as printing a drawing, you know, for the engineering staff to be able to, you know, make sure that everything's correct on this airplane, for instance, or whatever, you know, whether it's a car or whatever they're building. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it doesn't even extend that much to, I mean, you wouldn't have to be too large of an organization to even have it right. for the multiple locations. Right. We, we regularly work on, on um, deployments with uh, organizations smaller than Boeing <laughs> um, that, that obviously would, would just be hosting in, in a data center uh, a small amount of uh, kit in, in one location and, and like I said, maybe having it replicated elsewhere for whatever reason, maybe they've done that because they've got offices closer to those locations and it's, it's better to do it that way and actually want to make use of while we've got this, let's, let's say, well, if one of these data centers was to have a, a, a failure in any which way, um, it would 
fail over to the other data center and vice versa that we very regularly work on that we um yeah. we have a feature in the in, in our product um gslb global server load balancing which allows that if one geographic location was to have a failure and just takes out everything can fail over to a completely separate geographic location florida mm -hmm. has that Chicago can take over and, and all the connectivity, um, sorry, all of the, the traffic routes to there and said, you can be very clever with it. Um, and, and actually the more you dive into the different um, types of architecture that different organizations have and, and, and the capabilities of what load balancing can do, you, just, you can be very, very creative and yes. there's a, 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 an off the shelf solution that fits everyone. You can certainly, um, you, you, can, you can certainly say that there's a lot of similarities between a lot of the cases, but, but actually when it comes down to it and a high level conversation like we're having now can often identify a lot of that, a lot of what someone needs and just looking at how they're mapped out, you can really be very creative. Um, which is why I think it's, it's good to have, you need to, with, with when, I mean, when you are, cause I think this would lead us nicely onto looking at what you need in a load balance. So, I mean, well, that's a real advantage of a load yeah. balancer. And so, I mean, you could, a lot of folks are saying, well, can I just cluster? Can I just, you know, do replicated, you know, virtual devices and flip one on and turn another one off? Well, you might be able to, depending on the situation. But with a load balancer, you can specifically say, you know, I've got a rack of, you know, 15 servers. And if I see that this one server is down here, I know that I can, you know, process everything through this other server that is working. You have a lot more uh, definitive things that you're able to do with a load balancer than just a general cluster, which is just kind of an on off type thing with, with a whole system. Uh, so the network load balancer can say, well, it's really just this little piece right here. So let's just divert that. Everything else is running fine. And again, perhaps gives you time to fix that system or, you know, see what's going on with it. So th those are the real advantages of it. And especially in the print world, which people don't think about until they can't print. I go, oh my gosh, I can't print. What are we going to do? You know, so these are some things that hopefully um, the folks that are listening to this are saying, you know, maybe we should think about this proactively so that we don't have that situation where we're not able to get a print job, which is going to cause this to happen, this to happen, and, you know, all the repercussions that that will happen from not being able to print. And there are still so many industries that are very paper intensive. We've mentioned, you know, several of them through, you know, legal and through uh, universities, uh, higher education, uh, financial, uh, even real estate. Real estate's another one too that, you know, really needs to have that kind of on-demand capability for printing because things are happening, you know, right at the moment. So they, they need that speed of being able to get maybe a listing out or something, something along that line uh, or an application, you know, for the, for the customer. Because, you know, uh, in sales, you always want to strike when the iron's hot, you know, so you don't want to say, oh, well, I'll print that out and get it to you tomorrow. No, get that into today, <laughs> you know, so they can, you know, sign that on the dotted line and we get the ball rolling, you know, that's, that's a, always important. So, you know, this is what keeps businesses moving, keeps people productive and keeps orders coming into uh, the organization is by making sure that they're protected with high availability and, and network load balancing to ensure that everything's running smoothly. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. So what we want to look at then, I mean, how, how we're picking a, a, a low balance of finding what's going to work. I mean, it's, it's low balancing is a very mature market there. There is, you, you can like spoil for choice. Um, so when you're kind of going out there, what you're really looking for is something that is, uh, I mean, you want to be backed up by a technology partner that really understands about the print world, understands what what's what's going on, and 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 you can speak to with a level of confidence from from uh, I mean, from an engineer's point of view. You want to be able to speak to someone that can actually understand what you're talking about within the print space, because it's it's from from a from a supporting load balancing perspective. 
Um, it, it's just as much about knowing what the low balancer zins and outs are as, as actually what you're low balancing with um, or, or to. Um, so you need to be looking for, for someone that has support for these um, for these applications and understanding of, of what's involved, a bit of a back background in it. Um, that if you are struggling or if you need some advice or some guidance or something, you can you can you can get that sort of support that you need, that that kind of having an uh, an intelligent conversation around what you're after, not just a let's chat about low balancing only and anything outside of that is 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 not our problem, which uh it is something you need to kind of look out for. I, I guess really the summarizing points are, are to, to, to look at everything we've done is understanding, do you fully understand the, the, the weight at which your print environment carries? I mean, what do you, can you sit down and think, start to finish, what is it responsible for without that or with that impacting? Because it does happen, failures do happen. What what does that look like? What's the outcome of it? I mean, mm -hmm. what a load balance is not going to stop is a server failing. But what it's going to do is mean that in that situation, do you want either the traffic to be rerouted to an available server and a notification saying there's a problem, or do you want hard knocks on the system administrator's door to say, I've got a room full of people who can't do this, fix it right now, we're all waiting. There's two outcomes really, because again, I mean, that hurricane is going to hit the data center, whether it's stock full of load balancers or not. The, um, the, the temperature in the server room is going to rise and, and the server is going to overheat, whether you have a load balancer or not. It's just whether or not you have the infrastructure in place to accommodate your business continuity in that event. And that's what we're looking at. And then it's, making sure you've got the right partner to do that with someone who who understands what you're looking to do you can confidently see it is going to work they're gonna essentially look after you from start to finish really and that's that's kind of the key takeaways here um yeah. make sure those those three things are checked